you know that you're called to trust God. But realize this. There are many aspects of trusting God. And we're going to look at one such aspect in this week's study. So take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Genesis and chapter 24. The book of Genesis and chapter 24. We know that when someone obeys God, faithfully carries out what the word of God calls a believer to do, and the end result of that obedience, that submissiveness, that work is good. Who gets the glory? Well, the Bible says when they see your good works, that they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. So when we trust God, we do the right thing, and the results are desirable from God's standpoint, they are good works, they are fruit, God gets the glory. He should be praised. But what about when we equally submit to God, trust Him, obey His word, work diligently, being led by the Holy Spirit, and the results, well, they're not so much successful. They're not the desired results that we thought they would be. In fact, what if we, even in the midst of obedience, we fail? You know what? God also receives the outcome of that. Everything is upon his shoulders. And why do I emphasize that? Because sometimes we get so caught up in the results, what we think they should be. We think if we obey, always the outcome is going to be as uh, God desires. And the problem is, that may not be the case. Because of someone else's disobedience, someone else's rebellion, what could it be is not. And don't push the matter. Don't make it happen. Because... God is in control. He's able to deal with the disobedience, the rebelliousness of someone else. Now, this passage of scripture is a key one for us understanding how to trust God in the good times, but how to trust him when things aren't so successful, according to what we thought success would be. Well, look with me to verse 33. As I said, the book of Genesis, chapter 24, and verse 33. You'll recall that Eliezer and the group of men who were with him, they had made that journey from the land of Canaan. Now they have traveled north, they have arrived. He's come to that well of water, that spring. He has met Rivka, that is Rebekah, and God has revealed to him, God's faithful. He has revealed to him the right woman for Yitzchak, the son of Avraham. He has spoken to her. He has given her presence. And now she has invited him and the men who is with him to come back to her home and to enjoy hospitality. All the while, this man, Eliezer, he wants to finish his assignment. He wants to get a confirmation that this woman will indeed go back to the land of Canaan to be Isaac's wife. So notice what happens here. Again, verse 33. And he set before him to eat, meaning this man, Betuel, he puts before Eliezer. And the numerous men who were with him, food to eat. Now think for a moment. They have traveled a great distance. They have worked hard. And now it's evening time. They have traveled probably several days. I realize what the Midrash Rabbah says, that God uh, made their journey very speedy. This is not probably the case. That is a, a folklore of the rabbinical commentaries. Now, they had traveled a great distance, many days, and I'm sure they would have liked that good home cooking, a, a home-cooked meal to enjoy. But notice what Eliezer does. Again, verse 33, 
and he set before him to eat. And here's the key. But, and this is Eliezer speaking, he says, I will not eat until I have spoken my word. And the response is, speak. This is the leader said, speak your word. Verse 40, 34. A servant of Abraham am I, he said. The Lord has blessed my master, Me'od. Now, that is the word very, and the idea here is greatly. So, this man, Eliezer, a, a non-believer when this chapter began, has recognized that God has blessed Abraham a great deal. And he has grown and he has given to him, that is, Avraham has grown, that has become great. And God has given to him flocks and cattle and silver and gold, male servants and female servants, camels and donkeys. And now look at verse 36. And Sarah, the wife of my master, has borne a son unto him. And then it says... In her old age. And God has given all which is to him. So he recognizes. And the reason for this is very simple. Eliezer has seen supernatural blessing upon Avraham. He cannot attribute it simply to hard work. Being a wise individual. He has seen that the blessings has gone beyond that. And one of the things that has confirmed that is this child, Yitzchak, being born in Sarah and Avraham's old age. He makes it very clear. God has given to him this, this son. Verse 37. Now he's going to speak personally about what has happened recently to him. And we see here this verb. It's in the hithil, which is the causative. So it's an oath. But it does not mean I have taken an oath. Rather, it means that Abraham has caused me to take an oath. This is, in other words, serious business from Abraham's perspective. And let's learn a little bit about Hebrew grammar. Because many times, we just skip over what the scripture, the nuances of the Hebrew text wants to confirm to us. And that same thing is in the Greek text as well. The grammar has nuances and messages that if we fail to understand the grammar, we're going to miss out. So it's not just that, that this man took an oath. Abraham made him to take an oath. And that is to show the emphasis on how important this matter is to Abraham. So look carefully at verse 37. And my master, he made me or caused me to take an oath saying, do not take a woman for my son from the daughters of Canaan, which I dwell in his land. So we see a very important principle about not being unequally yoked in a marriage. We've talked about this briefly. In fact, much of what we're going to read today is a restatement of what we've already encountered. But there are some new facts that need to be emphasized. So Avram said, under no circumstances is Yitzchak going to marry a pagan woman, but rather one from my household. And we're going to see next week that this household knew God. They weren't always obedient. They always did not demonstrate faith like Avraham did. But they knew God by means of a unique revelation. Well, look now to verse 37 again. And my master, he caused me to take an oath saying, Do not take a woman for my son from the daughters of Canaan, whose land I dwell in. In verse 38, but rather to my father's house, you shall go to my family 
and you shall take a woman for my son. So the instructions are very, very simple. It's not hard to understand what Abraham has, has commanded Eliezer to do. But Eliezer, as you recall, he really did not think that this was going to happen. In other words, Eliezer, who represents the natural, he represents a earthly perspective. What seems reasonable, what seems logical, what is normal in this world. Avraham is very different. Avraham represents faith. He sees the impossibilities of humanity being overcome by God's involvement in our life. Now, do you accept that? Do you believe that? And do you live according to that? God will take that which is impossible, that which in the natural, from a human perspective, we would say it's not going to happen. That is just too unlikely. This is not normal. We shouldn't expect that. Avraham, when you read this text, it's even more, he is even more convincing in the repetition. And what's significant about that? Well, it's not Avraham saying it again. It is Eliezer. And what we see here in the change of the grammar and the wording and what's emphasized when Eliezer states it, we see that Eliezer believes it. He heard it at first, he didn't. But now he is confident. And that's how our faith and our behavior and our words should impact other people. So once again, look if you would to verse 40. We read, uh, let's go back to verse 39. And I said to my master, verse 39, Perhaps the woman will not go after me, meaning she won't follow me. So it's not a question of whether he's going to find the right woman or not. But what if that woman, perhaps, she won't agree to it. That she won't leave her family. She won't leave her city. She won't leave the culture of those people around her her friends and such, and make that long journey to a land that she's not familiar with, to marry a man that she's never met, and to dwell with another family that although she may have heard about, she's never personally seen with her eyes. So Eliezer is saying, it was very unlikely in my mind. So I said this, and notice the response of, of Eliezer. He said, this is how I used to think. This is what I said. But this is what Avraham said. Verse 40 now. And he said unto me, the Lord whom I have walked before. Once more, it's very important that we pay close attention to grammar. See, you can't see this in the English. But if I would simply to hear this in English, the God whom I have walked before, that's simply Elohim asher halakti lifanaf. But this is not the word halakti, meaning I have walked. No, it's another word. It is not the normal verbal stem, but rather it is the hitpa'el. What does that mean? Well, look at it. It is not halakti. It is hit halakti. And what is the significance of the hit palel? Well, this is normally understood as a reflexive. And one of the aspects of the reflexive is going to and fro, back and forth. In other words, sometimes the reflexive shows a consistency, something that happens over and over and over. What Avram is saying here is this, I am confident, I know this to be the situation because I've had dealings with God before. I have walked before God and in walking before God, always in and out, back and forth, to and fro, I have come to know God. 
See, when you walk with God, this is also an idiom for, for intimacy. So he knew the intimate God by, and here's the key, experience. In other words, Abraham had experienced the faithfulness of God. And that faithfulness that he has experienced from God caused him to be confident. He could anticipate what God was going to do. Why? Because God is faithful to his covenant. And all of this relates to the covenantal promises of God. So it's not I have walked before, but I have walked before consistently. That's what the nuance of this change of the verbal grammar means. Keep reading in verse 40. So he's confident that, that he will send his angel with me. And he will cause me to be successful on your way. And that's what Avraham is saying. God is going to be, be making you successful on your way. And you will take a woman for my son from my family from my father's house. So as Eliezer is quoting Avraham, he does so in a more powerful manner. With a confidence that, you know what? He didn't have when Avraham first said it to him. And why was that? Because he had not experienced God's faithfulness in his life. But as he begins to obey, walk with obedience to the commandment of Avraham, what did he begin to experience? Well, God gave him favor in arriving there in shalom, meaning without problems after that long journey. He arrived at the right place and God answered his prayer. What prayer? Well, we're going to come to that. Keep reading. Look now, if you would, to verse 41. Now, we're still talking about the, the what if, the perhaps, the Hebrew word ulai. So Eliezer is saying, you know, I told to Avraham, what if this woman, she won't follow after me back? And this is what he says. Then you will be clean from my oath, meaning you won't be obligated. You won't be, be in disobedience to me if it doesn't happen. And then he goes on to say, because you came to my family, and if they do not give to you, meaning if they don't give to you this woman, then you shall be clean from the oath. You're not going to have any obligations. You fulfilled my, my word to you. So it won't longer be any of your responsibility. It will be upon them. And here's the principle. Sometimes we can do everything right. But we get a situation here where what if the family said no? We're not going to let her go. We, we don't agree with this. We don't want her to leave. We don't believe like you believe. And therefore, she is staying. So Avram says, if this is the case, you will be free from your oath, clean. You will be exonerated from any guiltiness before me. Now look to verse 42. And I came this day, meaning today, to the spring or to the well. And I said, and here's the key. When we come to verse 42, realize something. And that is that Eliezer is praying. When he says, and I said, this is in the language of prayer. He is speaking to God. Look again at the text, verse 42. And I said, O Lord, God of my master, Avraham, if you will make successful my journey, which I am going upon. Now, what does he realize here? He realized success is dependent upon God, not upon you. So if you do everything out of obedience and you're successful, it's just because God. And if you do everything out of obedience that you do the task properly and there's not so much success, the results don't come about here again. That's dependent upon God. We don't get the glory, the praise, and we don't get the criticism. 
So he says in this passage of scripture, I said, Lord God of my master Avraham, if you, literally it's a term of petition, if you will make please successful my way, which I'm walking upon it. And behold, he says, I made this prayer. And then behold, verse 43. And remember the importance of that word, behold. It's to show what follows is of great significance. He says, behold, I'm standing above the spring of water, that well of water. And it came about, and here's what he says, the Alma. Now, you've got to go back to another scripture. Same chapter. Look, if you would, back to verse 16. Now, we talked about this last week. Where it says the young woman was beautiful in appearance. Very beautiful. She was a betula, which is a presumed version. Why do we say presumed? Because of that phrase, a man did not know her. But notice here in our verse, verse 43, the phrase is changed. No longer is the word betula there, betula. That word's not there. Why? Well, there's a change to Alma, and because Alma appears there, that Hebrew word, we know for a fact. This is not a presumed version, but this is one who's been verified as a version. So the phrase, who no man has known her, doesn't have to be there. And what is the intent? Well, the intent is to show, beyond any doubt, a change in Eliezer. Now he's fully convinced that she is the one approved by God. God has shown himself faithful in answering Eliezer's prayer. And he's going to say what that prayer is. We're going to review it. Look again, and it came about that the Alma went forth to draw, meaning to draw up water. And I said unto her, give me please a little of your water from your, your jar. Verse 44, and she said to me, also you drink and also for your camels I will draw. And remember, there was a lot of camels. It was a great deal of work and goes on verse 44 and the woman this is the woman she literally it's emphatic she is the woman which the Lord has proven for the son of my master meaning Isaac so he's convinced he said God I, I prayed that when I asked this woman that you want to be the wife of Yitzchak. When I ask her for water, not only will she give me water, but she will volunteer. I'll also give water to all your camels. Something that's out of the ordinary. This would have been a great deal of work for one woman to do. But she was quick to practice hospitality. And why is that important? Because hospitality is a major characteristic of the Torah. Now, the Torah had not been given, but this woman, Rivka, and we're going to see this undeniably next week, this woman had faith. A faith that trusted God. We'll see that, as I said, in our next installment. Verse 45. So he's referring to this prayer that he said to God. God, show me the woman who's right, that when I ask her for a drink, she will also give me a drink and also give water to my camels. Verse 45. And before I finish speaking to my heart. Now, underscore that. And that's literally what it says. Ani terem achale le deber el libi. Again, I, before I finish speaking to my heart. Now, why do I emphasize that? Because this is an idiom of prayer. Many Bibles may translate it meditating. Well, that's kind of a weak word. A lot of people meditate. People who do yoga meditate. We're not talking about meditation. We're talking about prayer. 
And that's what this is an idiom for. So Eliezer, he's recounting this prayer that he made. And verse 45 again, it says, And behold, Rivka, Rivka the Alma, Rivka the woman who's never known a man, she comes forth and her water jar upon her shoulder, and she came down to the well, and she drew, meaning drew water, and I said unto her, Give me a drink, please. Verse 46. And she hurried and she let down her water jar from upon her. And she said, drink. And also, and this is the emphatic, and also your camels, I will give drink. So she's doing exactly what was revealed to him in his prayer before God. To clarify, it goes back to what we see at the end of verse 44, where God gave proof. The word is leokiach, which is to prove that she became the proven choice by God of Isaac, that is to be Isaac's wife. Well, look again, verse, verse 46 and she hurried and went down, brought down the water jar from upon her. And she said, drink. And also your camels, I will give drink. And I drank and also the camels, she gave drink. Verse 47. And I asked her and I said, a daughter of who are you? And she said, the daughter of Betuel, the son of Nahor which Milka has borne to him. And I place a nose ring upon her nose and bracelets upon her hands. And notice the next part, verse 48. And this is what's so beautiful and what a principle is revealed. He goes back and he recounts what had happened, how God had revealed to him what to ask for, put it upon his heart. He prayed that and God manifested his choice for Yitzchak. And remember, what he said to Avraham, what he underscored to us again, to that family was, he really didn't think the first time it was possible. But after God had answered that prayer, that God had led him to the place, and of all the families he could have came into contact with, he came into the right one in the same language that Avram said his family was. When he realized that, he had a change of heart. No longer was Eliezer one who spoke about the God of his master. Notice what he did in verse 48. And this is the beauty. And this is what God wants to do in your life and in my life. When we even though we may be struggling with faith, we may be struggling with trust and obedience. But if we will just do that and we trust him, we obey him, we submit to him, doing what he has called us to do, what his word reveals, he is going to show himself to be faithful to us. He is going to bring prosperity. And here again, don't hear that word prosperity and always assume financial prosperity. Let me tell you, sometimes it is Financial. Sometimes it is prosperity in health. But sometimes that prosperity, in fact, more often than not, that prosperity is simply that you have the privilege, the honor of participating with God in his will. And if that doesn't excite you, if that doesn't change you, well, you have a serious spiritual problem. Eliezer, notice what he did. When he was convinced, God's at work in my situation. God is blessing my service unto him. God is making prosperous my service unto the Lord. Notice what he did. Look at verse 48. It says, va ekod. That is a word for, for bow. It means to bow your head. And it is to show submissiveness it is to show a recognition of God's authority. Now, this is big. 
He is recognizing God's authority in his life. And what does that lead you to do? Well, look at the next phrase. Va eshtachave le'ashem. And he, your Bible will say, worship is a word kind of to prostrate himself, to submit to. It's a very, very important word. Yes, it is a word that means worship, but one is to kind of uh, bow the head, the first one. The second one is to, to be prostrate before the Lord. It demonstrates a total submissiveness, that desire to bow in the presence of God. It's a recognize, recognizing of him within worship. So what does this speak to? This is the first time. Now he's prayed one time before this, but now he's worshiping God. A great statement. And he says, and I will bless the Lord, the God of my master, Avraham, who has led me on this way, what way? Notice, of truth. Bederich emet. Now, this is important today. I was meeting with some, some new friends, people that I had never uh, uh, met before, my wife and I. She had communicated in the emails with them. And we were talking. And the word that, that I would take away from this meaning is this family wanted the truth of God. That's the thing I took away from our meeting. They were people who were interested in knowing the truth of God so they could submit to the truth of God. And notice what we see here. The first thing out of Eliezer's mind is not simply an experience, but rather he has come to know truth. And that's why the whole foundation of our, our ministry is to do under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, submissive to the word of God. We want to reveal truth. And we are grateful that we have the opportunity to do that. And I say we, there's many people who are involved, not just in supporting our work financially, but also many people play an important role in bringing the final, final video into to your viewing. So we are grateful for the opportunity to reveal truth. And we understand that truth doesn't begin or end with us. In fact, it doesn't have anything to do with us. It is from the word of God. God inspired this truth. We only repeat what he has said. And notice Eliezer, he says, And I bless the Lord, the God of my master Avraham, who has led me on the way of truth to take a daughter from my master's brother for, my, for his son. So he's convinced. He's worshiping God. Why? Worship brings a change to the situation. Now, we talked about earlier that sometimes we, we work, we submit, we obey, we trust, and we, we labor diligently for God. That's all well and fine. But if you don't put in the midst of that service worship, you know what? You're not going to experience the success, the full measure of success that, that God wants you to. And that's why you're not going to have that contentment. You're not going to have that peace. You're not going to have that, that just that inner feeling of, I am with God. God and I have done this together. That he has given me a great privilege to work with him. He doesn't need us. It's an honor that God includes us in his work. And Eliezer knew this. So he worshiped, he said, I bend my head and I bow to the Lord. I will bless the Lord, the God of my servant, my master, Avraham, who has led me on the way of truth. Remember that the way of truth to take a daughter from my master's brother for his son. Verse 49. And now. Great word. Now. We come to the moment of truth. Eliezer says, and now after you've heard that testimony, let me tell you, 
testimony about what God has done in your life makes a difference. Be expecting God to move. Ask God, what is it that you want to do in my life that I can share with others? There's a power of testifying of God's presence, his leadership in your life. So he has testified and he says, and now if you will make, and he says, if you will make chesed. Now chesed is what we would call grace, the Old Testament word for grace. But notice how it's used here. It is, now sometimes it's translated loving kindness or mercy, but it's the general word for grace, chesed. And it's usually, and this is the, one of the passages that gives us this understanding, it's tied to purpose, the purposes of God. One of the outcomes of grace, when I receive it by faith, is that it brings about the fulfillment of, of the will of God, his covenant promises, his covenant blessings in the situation. Maybe in my life, maybe in someone else's. So he says, now, if you all, and it's in the plural, meaning to this family, if you are, are going to make chesed and truth. Chesed ve emet. By the way, the Apostle Paul, in writing the New Testament, so often Paul used the same term, chesed ve'emet. So he says in this passage, if you are going to make chesed, grace, and truth with my master, tell me, but if not, tell me. So he says, what, what say you? You've heard the story. You have heard how I have testified, how I have come to Rivka, Rebecca. And now I'm sharing with you in a spirit of worship, in a spirit of, of assurance. She is God's choice. Remember the word Alma. One that has been verified as a virgin. And that's usually done prior, immediately prior to a wedding. So he's saying, God has verified this woman to be the wife of Yitzchak. So tell me what you're going to do. If you were going to make Chesed ve'emet, grace and truth with me. You're going to make this journey prosperous. Tell me. But if not, he says, also tell me. Now, he didn't try any more convincing or proving or what. He says, it's up to you. You are going to be given this moment of opportunity to agree with God and to participate with him or not. And when we miss out on those moments, well, let me tell you. Oftentimes, the results, well... They are disappointment, they are shame, they are grief, and they can have eternal consequences. I realize that's hard to hear, but they can have eternal, long-lasting consequences. So he says, make it known to me, yea or nay. And he says, if it's no, I will turn to the right or to the left. Now here again, he, he's not pleading. He's not going to say, well, maybe you didn't hear me right the first time. Let me tell you again. No, he says, it's time to make a decision. Yes or no. If it's yes, we're going to have a meal together. We're going to have fellowship. But if it's no, I want to know right now, because we're all getting up and we're leaving. They weren't thinking about the food. They weren't thinking about how long they had gone without a nice home-cooked meal. They were thinking about God's purposes, his plans, his will, his assignment. So let me ask you as we close, are you thinking about God's assignment on your life? Because if you're not moving towards the fulfillment of that assignment, and we have many assignments along our faith journey, you know what? If we are not moving on that journey, we're not going to be able to worship God with the, the proper, proper experience. Service leads to worship, and worship leads to success. A great principle to remember. Well, we'll close with that. Until next week, shalom from Israel.